amongst all the heaviness that is going on in the world, um, I get these little moments of just, just really bright fun. It's, it's a beautiful day. I get to see your beautiful faces. Um, my niece is now living with us, and we have endless entertaining conversations. And um, as we were sitting there this week, um, I was asking her if, if she had heard anything more about Texas. And she said, Texas? What's going on in Texas? And I was like, well, there's a big hurricane, and, and I guess it's downgraded now to a tropical storm, and, and uh, there's really bad stuff. But she goes, oh, the giant avocado. <laughs> what? It felt like it came out of left field, not a, <laughs> from my niece, but the giant avocado over Texas. And I said, what do you mean? And here's the picture she showed me, so I'm gonna move out of the way. So. <laughs> Now, I know it's not nice to laugh at disasters, but <laughs> it's kind of the giant avocado. Um, which was really interesting, because um, at the same time, I was in the midst of, of prepping for a sermon, and um, I was looking at, at videos of storms. Um, but yeah, there's one. Uh, there is a place in Washington, though, if you live on the coast, that uh, may not be quite as bad as Texas, but it's still pretty bad, and I wanted to show it to you. Now, um, in order to do that, we had to do a video, and I, um, we have yet to tackle technology well in this church, so with Will's help, we're gonna attempt to do this. I'm gonna hand him the mic so that we can hear it this time. It's really exciting. <laughs> Folks here knew this third storm was going to pack a punch. High tide mixed with high waves and high winds taking their toll on yet another Washaway Beach home. A few weeks ago, this vacation home was a few blocks from the beach. Now it's part of the beach. It's gone. Came faster than we thought. Yeah, for sure. A lot faster. Jim Green knows all too well. His home fell prey to the eroding shoreline earlier this week. When he bought the place 10 years ago, the beach was miles away. You know, when we bought it, there's a page that says, Erosion, you sign your name and oh, erosion, That's not, that doesn't concern us. And there's no insurance, no government assistance, just a loss. It's been going on for quite some time, but it's been extremely aggressive this year. Tim Betts' vacation home is ready to tip into the ocean at any moment. Much of it is undermined with waves continuing to eat away at his property. Tuesday, his neighbors, the Savers, watched as their home tipped in and then was devoured by the sea. This area is actually called North Cove, with a school and dozens of homes now all gone. I think this is just mother nature. I think this was all ocean at one time. It's all sand, and it's just reclaiming itself. I think it's just uh, the currents are doing what they do to take it down there. So the folks here are just resigned to the fact that one day their home is going to be gone too. So you might as well mark the moment. Cheers, buddy. <laughs> Um, that's not how I respond when my home gets washed away. Whatever floats your boat, guys. Or floats your home, I guess it is. Um, yeah. So, in case you haven't guessed, um, we're gonna we're gonna continue our series of, of parables by looking at a parable about uh, two builders. Um, one who built his home on sand, and one who built his home on a rock. Uh, and and I love that picture from Grayland to help put it in perspective for us. But um, I'm gonna be reading from Luke chapter six. If you have a Bible and you want to turn there, or an app that you want to open up and look at it, it's um, starting in verse forty six. And um, let me just read this passage for us. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? And I will show you what he is like, who comes to me and hears my word and puts them into practice. He's like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when a flood came, the torrent struck the house, but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. And the moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed, and its destruction uh, was complete. Let's pray. God, um, we want lives that are full. We want lives that um, are unshakable, that can stand the torrents when they come. And so I pray that you would open this passage up for us. I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would meet us. You'd meet us right where we are. Um, in whatever kind of week or year or month or whatnot we're having. Um, speak to us now, and, and Lord, the stuff of, of 
what I say that's chaff, let it be blown away, but, but the stuff that's from you, or plant it deep in our hearts. Um, let it land on bedrock and, and become a part of us. We love you. Amen. Um, I've told you guys uh, uh, time and time again, and, it, it's, and it's definitely continuing to grow in me that um, at the heart of the gospel is, is John 10.10. 10. Um, and, and what John 10.10 10 says is this, I, I've come that you have life and have it to the full. Um, that's, that's God's vision and desire for us, that we would have a full, abundant life, as, as full of a life as we can have. Um, there's another part to that passage. It comes right before it. It says that there's a, a thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come that you might have life and have it to the full. And um, there are forces that um, would seek to take away life from us, that, that um, bring destruction into our lives. And um, Jesus, in this, in this parable, um, realizes both of those things. And so... Um, as we look at this passage, I pray that uh, God just shows us how we can have that life that's, that's to the full, but um, doesn't get destroyed in an unshakable life. And um, as I dug around in this passage, three things kind of jumped out to me. And they were three things that, that both builders had in common. Um, and, and the first is simply this. Both people encountered storms. Um, that uh, That's part of life. And... and um, in the beginning of, of everything, when God created the heavens and the earth, it, it was good. There wasn't brokenness in it. Um, and uh, at the end of it, when God sets all things right, there won't be any more brokenness in it. But in this in-between time, um, there are storms. And um, some of those things we bring on ourselves. Some of them are brought on by other people. And some of them are just because the world has gone sideways and got, uh, got broken in the process. Um, but the reality is that no one gets out of it unscathed. Um, and in the words of Jim Morrison's autobiography, no one gets, or is it his biography? I think it's his biography. Uh, no one gets out alive. It's the title of it. It's a great book, by the way. Um, but in the midst of the storms uh, that I've experienced, there's this sense of asking, where is God? Because we, we intuitively know that God is good and gives life. And yet, here we are suffering. So this, this doesn't connect for us. Um, at least it doesn't connect for me. And um, those storms come up in different areas. And each time I've experienced those storms, they kind of bring about that response for me. Um, I know one big storm was a, a relational storm that I experienced. There was a girl before I met Christina that I thought I was going to marry. And um, the more time we spent together, the more it didn't seem like uh, this was a good thing for either of us. Um, but we really genuinely loved God and genuinely loved each other. And so, but we felt like we were supposed to leave. And, and, and in the midst of that, I was thinking, God, if this is what following you is like, I don't want to have anything to do with you. you you're bringing destruction. Um, second biggest storm that I had uh, was watching my dad's health. I mean, that's another sort of storm that we hit. Like, our health just doesn't go on forever, and we feel like it should and it stinks when it doesn't um, my dad was a avid hiker he was um, kind of a health nut and Christina and I used to joke about how he would always give us a hard time about how we were not exercising enough or not eating right or whatnot um, and uh, at a pretty young age he got cancer and um, we lost him I just felt like God where where are you in this um, Another kind of storm was, was a, a career storm that I had, and, and I think, um, as I tell these stories, I, I'm pretty sure that you have storms coming up in your life that you can think of, but um, I was working at a church, I felt called to be at this church, I really liked the church, I liked the people, um, but me and the leadership of that church didn't get along, and um, at the end of when I decided, okay, we're not going to do this anymore, um, it was kind of a mutual decision. I was like, I don't want to have anything to do with church ever again. That didn't really <laughs> work out for me. Um, but, um, yeah, I just melted down. I'm like, ah, oh, God, where are you if you're not a part of the church? Um, and there's this lie that I bought um, that comes with storms where we go, man, God must not be in it. Um, 
Um, and in this story, Jesus says that the storms come on, on both people. Um, and God is in it, in the storms of our lives with us. Um, we were taught to do camp testimonies when I showed up at, at camp. Um, and in camp testimony, what they taught us, here's the format of it. You're given a couple minutes, like maybe 10 minutes or something. And the first third you're going to spend on how something was terribly broken in your life. And then the next third, you're going to spend on how you met Jesus in it, or met Jesus for the first time. And then the last third, you're going to talk about how great it is now. <laughs> Which seemed like it was a really good format. Um, except it painted this picture again and again and again and again and again, that um, I used to have storms, then I met Jesus, and now I don't have storms anymore. <laughs> Isn't that great? Do you, you want to not have storms? Come meet Jesus. Um, and no one ever in those camp testimonies quoted John 16, which says that in this life you will have many troubles. Actually, let me read it for you. It's, a, it's an interesting verse. Um, but it doesn't talk about leaving us alone in it. Get all nervous, and then that makes it harder. John 16:33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have troubles. Take heart, I've overcome the world. Um, our lives look different when we hit storms because of Jesus. Um, we don't go through them the same. Um, we have a peace sometimes that can stick with us. And even if we don't have a peace, um, we overcome. Uh, the idea that we don't have troubles, I mean, we're following a guy who, who got nailed to a cross. So um, <laughs> like that's where we're going. But we're also following a guy who rose again with power. Um, and in the midst of the storms, the things that try to steal, kill, and destroy don't get to win. That's creating. Um, maybe unshakable life isn't the right word. Maybe an un undestructible life. Um, but we still get shaken. Um, in Matthew 3, uh, John the Baptist is on the scene and and he's um, describing his ministry, and he says, you know, I've come, and I baptize you with water, but after me is coming one who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, and his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear the threshing floor, and he will separate the chaff from the wheat, and he will gather up the wheat, and the chaff will be blown away. And it was describing, uh, in biblical times, you would just take all the wheat, all the stuff you got out of the field, and then they would take these forks and they would unsettle them. They would throw this stuff around and, and it was rigorous and it was destructive. And it probably didn't feel so good to the wheat. Um, and in the process it would get broken. But what would happen is the good stuff would get left on the floor and the other stuff would get blown away by the wind. Um, and sometimes that's what the storms do. Um, depending on where we build our life. Now, I want to be more chaff than wheat. The storms are going to come. I'm going to get refined. I'm going to get winnowed. I'm going to get uh, broken. But I want some stuff that remains. And I want most of it to remain. I don't want to get to the end of my life. I don't know why I'm dedicating this sermon to my dad, I guess. But I want to get to the end of my life and go, man, so much of my life just got blown away. I want some stuff that matters, that lasts. Um, which brings me to the second point. Um, both these builders, they built something. They did. We're going to build something. Um, there are very few people who wander through life and don't build anything. Um, even if they don't do much of anything, that in itself is a choice. We're going to build our lives. We're going to invest them somewhere. Um, I read a book about guys who make uh, Scrabble their life. Like their life goal to be the top Scrabble players. An interesting group of people, isn't it? Um, but that's what the 
they're building their life on. And, and um, as crazy as that seems, we do uh, invest ourselves in something. So the question is, how do we do it? And what do we do it with? Um, and Jesus talks about two ways of building. And um, in the Middle East, there's a lot of sand. Wow, shocker. Thanks, Captain Obvious. Um, <laughs> But Nazareth in particular, there's there's a lot of sand, um, and uh, Jesus is saying these words in the middle of Roman occupation and the way the Roman government um, kept these things going and created this enormous army and had the wealth that it did was heavy taxation on anywhere that they conquered. We'll provide you peace with our military soldiers um, occupying your land, uh, but you're going to pay for it, and it wasn't a choice. So, um, so there's a lot of poor people around um, and as they're thinking about man I, I'm gonna build a house how am I gonna build it they had a couple options they could build on the sand um, and hope at last hope that there wouldn't be a storm or they could dig down and in Nazareth that was about 30 feet that they would have to dig down to get to rock and then they would build archways pillars and archways actually I'll put a picture up of uh, this is in Jerusalem but it's it's the same idea. You build up a big giant archway, and on that you could lay a foundation because it, it goes down to the rock. Um, I don't know if everybody had the means to do that, but um, this is the picture. Two ways of building. One that's easy, uh, one that's hard, one that's cheap, one that's expensive. And, and if you built down on a rock, you could put your house on it, and it wasn't going to go anywhere. But if you didn't, um, you were hoping that the storm wouldn't come back to point one, the storms eventually come. Um, and I watched this work out in my dad's life. Um, I remember when he retired, he was a middle school teacher, which is a crazy career. I'm so glad he was called to it and not me. But middle school teacher, uh, career long, and I remember when he retired, he had identified himself as a teacher. He poured his life into teaching, and then he was like, well, what am I going to do now that I'm not a teacher and um, he's like well and eventually he settled into a, a couple of things um, one was hiking loved going long hikes like long long backpacking hikes another one was um, his faith he had gotten really excited about his faith he was he was learning more about um, Christianity and, and um, sharing that with other people and then um, the other thing was serving other people. He had connections with the Boy Scouts through his whole life, so he was he was helping out kids um, through that, and food banks, and Habitat for Humanity, anything he could get his hands on, he would he would want to do. Um, and when he got cancer um, and started to get a little sicker, hiking wasn't on the plate anymore. But you know, he still had these Boy Scouts he could pour his life in. He still was able to pour into that. And he still had his faith. Um, and as he got sicker, as another storm got a little bit bigger, um, he didn't have the Boy Scout thing anymore. But you know, he still had his faith. Um, and when he passed away, when he got to that point, um, when he faced the storm that we will all face one day, um, that's the one that destroys most everything, doesn't it? Except he still had his faith. Um, with our hope in Jesus comes this foundation that can't be taken away, that the world can bring its worst, and um, we will still have the hope of glory. We still look forward to a day when things will be set right and we will be alive with God. We will rise again and overcome the greatest storm in life. Um, I'm not very good at planning or strategizing. We were having this discussion earlier this week, um, and, and I was going, man, I, I'm not so good at that. So how do I, how do I do that? How do I invest in something that lasts and that is eternal? Um, and I, and here at least was my my answer about it. Where am I useful to God and to other people? Where does that happen? Uh, well, I hope it's preaching, so if this is a useless sermon, come let me know. Um, I hope it's in preaching, but I also hope it's in, in walking alongside people and talking to them about their life and their faith and meeting with folks one-on-one. -on -one. So I try to spend time there, and I thank you all for the opportunity to do that. Um, 
But I remember one of the first teachings that I ever got to do, I did it at Mill Creek Foursquare and it was on vocation. And I talked about this idea of finding passion and where God finds you useful and then putting yourself in those spots. Um, where do you find life and where, do you, where can you go to get life as well as to serve other people? And um, this guy came up to me afterwards and goes, Chris, that's really great that you're able to like invest in uh, this faith that you, you care so much about, but uh, I got mouths to feed, I got kids. I gotta take care of business and, and make money, and um, so I have to be an accountant. And at the time, I kind of go, well, good luck. <laughs> but I didn't have the wisdom to say that maybe it's not what you do, but how you do it. You can still build your life on the rock. You can still build your life in, in, in um, listening to God's word and trying to go about whatever it is that you do in a way that would be pleasing um, to him. Because that's the difference between these two builders. Um, Maybe it's not where, but, but how. Um, and the third, third thing that I want to bring to light is the fact that um, in this parable, they both heard the word. Jesus says, you know, uh, let me tell you the difference between these guys. One guy heard the word and he didn't do what I said. And, and uh, another guy did hear my words and he did do what I said. And, and that's the difference. Well, they both heard the word. Um, that first verse of, of this passage is, is really strong. Verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and yet don't do what I say? Um, and to me, I feel like sometimes when I read that, I'm like, man, I feel like I'm in trouble. Like, God's mad. Uh, and, uh, and I want to put some heart behind that phrase. Why do you think Jesus says that? Is it because he's... he's um, he needs us to somehow recognize his authority for his sake, that, that he's feeling snubbed, uh, that God somehow is, is, is going, man, if only they would listen to me, then I would feel better about myself. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think that's it. No. The core of it is, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. And so if Jesus is trying to give us life and, until we can have it to the full, and then we hear his words and go, yeah, definitely, I'm right on Jesus' page. But then we don't want to do it. We rob ourselves of life. Um, I have a lot of experience with this. I was um, trouble growing up. Man, I put my mom through the ringer. Um, I remember in, at one point in high school, I had a 1.14 GPA. Um, I didn't have a senior year because I failed too many classes. And um, yet I wasn't outwardly rebellious. I wasn't like just yelling at my mom or anything like that. She was like, hey Chris, do your homework. And I'm like, sure thing. <laughs> then I go do my own thing. Then she'd be like, show me your homework. You haven't been turning it in. And so I would find like old assignments and I would erase the teacher's like little check mark on it. And then I would show it to her and be like, see, here's what I'm supposed to turn in tomorrow. They weren't on like online tools to check on your kid or else I would have had to come up with much better ways to rebel. Um, but the end result of hearing what she said but not doing it was not passing classes. Um, my dad was a teacher and he emphasized education. It was very, very important. And um, if I came home from school and, and said, he'd say, well, what did you learn at school? And I'd say, well, nothing half the time because I didn't really go to school. But um, I didn't learn anything at school. And then he'd say, well, let's grab an encyclopedia so you can learn something today. <laughs> open it up to some random thing and I'd be like, great, now I know about mangoes. Excellent. <laughs> um, but through this process, I learned to love uh, these moments of learning something, of being inspired, of, of having some realization. Like, I, I love our Wednesday mornings. We, we get together, we, we read some scripture, and we go, man, how does this apply to my life? And, and more times than not, I go, wow, that's important to remember. But the problem is, too often I get stuck right there. It doesn't actually translate into later on in that day or later on in that week. Um, and that's what Jesus is saying here. Come that you might have life and have it to the full. Why, why do you 
hear my words and say, Lord, Lord, but not do what I say, because it's in the doing that the life comes. Um, one, of the, one of the Christian artists that I really appreciate is a guy by the name of Rich Mullins. Uh, Our God is an awesome God. He, he wrote that song and um, his album. And he had this like down-to-earth, simple, uh, kind of gritty faith that I just loved. And, and I, at one point I got really interested in him and started listening to radio interviews with him. And I remember this one interview where um, the guy was interviewing was like, oh, Rich, that was such a good concert last night. Uh, it was so moving. And it was like, God was present and just doing stuff. And it, it, was, it was powerful. And Rich goes, I hope so. We'll see. And the guy asked him about it. He's like, what do you mean you, you hope so? We'll see. Like, what do you mean by that? And he, and he said, you know, I think God moving has to do with making fruit in our lives. It, it produces something. And so um, I figure God moved at one of my concerts when I get a note from somebody saying, uh, I was about to, to leave my wife and then I went to your concert and I decided not to. Or uh, I went to your concert and, and I've, I've, I've rededicated my life to, to following God again. That, that's, a, that's a change. That's fruit. That's doing something. Um, the context of Jesus telling this story about building on a rock or building on sand is right after the Sermon on the Mount. Um, it's, it's two chapters of Jesus talking about how do we live with God? How do we live in God's kingdom so that we experience all that God has for us? And um, some of the topics in the Sermon on the Mount, um, good deeds, hate and reconciliation with, with our enemies. Um, how do you make promises about what you will do or won't do? Um, how do you have relationships? How do you treat your enemies? How do you pray? How do you judge or not judge others? Um, how do you give to God financially? Like money. Jesus talked actually more about money than he ever did heaven or hell. That seems weird because we've spent a lot of time talking about what he says about heaven and hell. Um, and yet, I think Jesus actually intended this faith to be about doing life. Um, the Bible actually talks more about uh, injustice and justice and care for the poor than the afterlife. Um, if we want to see Jesus transform our lives, if we wonder what God has for us, um, it's going to involve doing. And honestly, as much as I love learning, as much as I love insights, as much as I love a good sermon, the tiniest word that I put into practice has more power than me listening to sermon after sermon after sermon after sermon. Um, my dad grew up the son of a pastor and going to church a heck of a lot, more than he ever wanted to. And, um, and he was a dutiful Christian. And when I grew up in his house... Um, he was kind of like an angry, dutiful Christian. Like, we have to go to church, because that's what we do. Um, but I never saw it filter down into our lives. I never knew how it was going to be, how it was put into practice. And there didn't seem any joy in it. It was just an obligation. And um, when I became a Christian, my dad began to relook at his faith. But um, at the same time, God put Habitat for Humanity in his path. And Habitat for Humanity said, you know what? You can follow Jesus by coming with us and building houses for the poor. And he's like, you mean I can do something besides sit around and listen to sermons? This is fantastic. And so he started going on trips and building houses. And then they were like, hey, you've been on a number of trips. Do you mind leading the Bible study? And he's like, oh, I should probably see what the Bible says. And he started looking at that and then teaching other guys about it. And the result was watching this like joy and passion uh, infuses life. It was like rocket fuel um, for him. <coughs> I want rocket fuel in my life for good things. Um, and where am I going to find it? Uh, not just in the hearing, but in just doing. So, uh, now what do we do? What do we do with this? Um, I think the first step is hearing. We gotta hear the word to know what to do. So maybe start looking at what Jesus has to say, and um, and yet doing that in a way of going. I wonder if this says anything for now that I should respond to. Um, 
we had this old uh, way of thinking about it at, uh, that I learned called SOAP. I might have told you about it before, but it was, it was read a chapter. I don't know if this structure helps or not, but read a chapter. And then um, if something sticks out to you, go, huh, you know, just look at that verse again. And then, uh, so that's the S of SOAP. And then O was observation, like make an observation, go, what is this actually saying? What is, what is this pointing at? Uh, is there anything that I might be able to learn from this? And then that's the O, and then A of SOAP is apply it. And applying it can be, I need to think about this other person differently. I need to believe a little differently than I have about who God is. Or it can be, I just need to do this. Um, and then lastly, just pray. Because we need the Holy Spirit's help if we're going to be doers. Um, apart from God, we can't do much. Or if you want to make it more fluid than that, just where is God's Word challenging you? Have you read his word enough for it to challenge you? And if it's challenging you, start to lean into that. You go, why does this push me? Um, how could this change me? And then the second piece of it is just do something. Do. Invest in God this week, today, in some other person, in some practical way that you go, man, I think this might make God smile if I did this, so I'm just going to do it. Because it's in the doing that we move from a life that gets destroyed to a life that lasts and is unshakable. Um, it's pretty simple and yet incredibly challenging. And so I'm going to ask God to help us um, this week do that. And then we're going to have a closing song. So let's pray. God, um, we don't want to be just hearers, because hearing doesn't transform us. We want to be people who find life. Um, and we believe that you have words of life, and you have a foundation. Um, the world has all kinds of ways to shake us, but um, we want your um, goodness and power and life and passion. And so God, um, bring to mind, bring to our eyes the stuff that you would have us do. Help us to be people who put your words into practice, who don't just listen. Um, help us to be people who aren't just blown about by whatever life throws at us. Um, and help us to be people who find bedrock, um, something solid that we can put our weight down on, um, where we can find peace and be overcomers. Lord, we love you. Amen.